In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to our preparation for preaching the Word of God and studying the Word of God for this Sunday, the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's walk through the readings, and let's really try to investigate what these readings are talking about, okay? So we go to the very first reading from the prophet, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is an amazing prophet because he's actually preaching to those who are in exile. But as he's preaching, you see where his prophecy is going back and forth. He seems to be somehow spiritually transported between the exiles or those who are exiled near the river Chabar. And then, and then he's brought to Jerusalem and then suddenly he sees these visions over in Jerusalem of the presence of God departing from the city. So what's amazing about the prophecy of Ezekiel and, and also Jeremiah is they prophesy before, during, and after the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's key to understanding the message in Ezekiel and also in Jeremiah. And so uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel had this incredible vision of the very throne of God. And on the throne of God, he saw one, he saw a figure who was like a man, a human figure. This is really amazing because it prepares us to understand who Jesus is, true God and true man. So you have to go back to Ezekiel chapter 1 and read the very end of the chapter to get that throne scene. And then right after that throne scene, that's when God addresses the prophet, and that's chapter 2. So let's go through chapter 2 and see what happens. There's just one more note I want to add in that this note is that the exiles were kind of taken away in three different groups. They were taken out of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel seems to be in the second group. And so exiles are taken away, uh, taken from the city. People are literally taken from the city by the Babylonians into exile in 605, 592, and 587, approximately. Okay. And so the context is Ezekiel is strengthening the faith of those who are being taken away into exile. And he's also telling, telling them about, you know, here's what's going on in Jerusalem. Here's the sin of our people. This is why Jerusalem is being destroyed. So let's go to chapter two. And here's what it says. And he said to me, now this is the one who's on the throne, son of man, stand upon your feet and I will speak to you. And when he spoke to me, the spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels. Now notice how the, this is described. It doesn't sound very good. Who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. So this is a continual prophetic theme. God is sending his prophets to a disobedient people, to his own people. What's amazing about this is that if you study the prophets of the Old Testament, you'll see that Elijah and Elisha did miracles with Gentiles. Now, there's a reason why. There wasn't faith in Israel in the north where they were preaching. And then Jonah preached to Gentiles, and they listened, they listened to him. But the, but the prophets who went to the northern kingdom, Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah, they were rejected. And now Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they will also be rejected by this rebellious people. The people are also imprudent and stubborn. I send you to them. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. In other words, you're going to tell them that this message is directly from the Lord. You are a, a speaker on behalf of the Lord, a mouthpiece for the Lord. You're delivering the message of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that there has been a prophet among them. So the, the job description here, if you will, is that Ezekiel has to proclaim the word of God. It does not matter if they listen to him or not. 
but they will know that there has been a prophet. If they're obedient and they listen, they will see, look at how our lives were saved because we listened to the prophetic word. If they're disobedient and they perish, they will also know there has been a prophet through an act of judgment. Salvation for the obedient, judgment for the disobedient. The prophet himself has to simply be faithful to preach the word of God. And it goes on and says, and you son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Don't worry about them. Don't let them intimidate you. Through, uh, it says, though briars and thorns are with you and sit and you sit upon scorpions, be not afraid of their words. So briars and thorns are associated with the curse. If you remember when Adam sinned, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, it's associated with that curse. It's basically saying this is an unfruitful people here. They, they are unfruitful. They are, not, they are not being obedient to the Lord's covenant. So that's what you're going to be surrounded by, Ezekiel, a people who are unfaithful. Nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. So look at how the Lord in, in various ways is saying, don't let this disobedient people influence you or intimidate you. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, there's much that we could say about this. You know, first and foremost, we live in the midst of a rebellious generation. You look at the generation that we live in, and it's often not open to the faith. And so, you know, when we read what Ezekiel has to go through, in many ways, we can identify with this in our own generation. When we talk with others about the faith, we're often rejected by a rebellious people, okay? Um, and then when you look at this first reading, you can also understand why did the church pick this reading? Because in the gospel, Jesus will go back to Nazareth, his own home, and he will be rejected. So, there's a lot that we could say here. We're often rejected by those who know us very well. And then we can even see, if you look at our generation and how our own generation has rejected the faith, you look at the teachings of, of you know, life from the moment of conception, you look at marriage, you look at all of the toughest teachings that we have in the church, and you look, and we live in the midst of a unfaithful generation that has rejected that. And so we go out into this, into the darkness of this world and we bring the light of Christ. It says, let's go through my notes here. So first and foremost, the figure on the throne speaks to Ezekiel. Okay. So you have to go back to the end of chapter one to really get the context. And what's amazing is the figure on the throne is described as like having the appearance of a man. And that's, what's really amazing because it seems to be a theophany. A theophany is a manifestation of God in the Old Testament, but the human-like description helps us to, in a certain way, understand how this is anticipating the incarnate Jesus, our Lord, who became incarnate in the fullness of time. So that's what's absolutely amazing about the description at the end of chapter one. Finally, it says the figure on the throne has the appearance of man. He speaks to Ezekiel, addressing him as son of man. This is a term, son of man. It simply means, in the book of Ezekiel, it just means human being. It's, uh, it comes up like over 90 times. I think it's 99 times in the book of Ezekiel that you see this phrase, son of man. And so in one sense, it underlines Ezekiel's vulnerable humanity, okay? The transitory nature of all human things. And at the same time, the prophet is filled with the spirit of the Lord. He's sent on a mission to speak the word of God. And so we should make a clear distinction between the references to Ezekiel as the son of man, underlining his human state. Okay. Uh, and then when you get to Daniel chapter 7, verses 10 through 14, there's a figure that's described as being like a son of man. And this figure right here is a heavenly figure. And Jesus essentially explains that he is the son of man in Daniel chapter 7. And you see that especially when he stands before the high priest and he talks about the son of man 
coming upon the clouds. It's a direct reference to Daniel chapter 7. So you go to Mark chapter 14, verses 60 to 66, Matthew 26, towards the end of the chapter, you see where our Lord clearly associates himself with the figure in Daniel chapter 7. Okay, so in Ezekiel, going back to the book of Ezekiel, the Lord says that he's sending his prophet to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation. Now, this underlines how the people who are actually in Judah and Jerusalem have become so rebellious. And to give you a little bit of history, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in 722 BC. The southern kingdom of Judah with the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed in 587 BC. Now you think the southern kingdom would have learned they, and you think that they would have been you know, faithful, but no, actually they did the opposite. They fell into similar forms of apostasy. Ezekiel underlines how grave this apostasy is in chapters eight through 11. They're sacrificing their children to false gods and in a place which is eventually going to be known as Gehenna, Ben-Hinnom, Gehenna, which is just southeast of Jerusalem. And so they're worshiping false gods and worship of false gods has crept right into the temple courts. And even the elders of Israel are bowing to these false gods. And so the prophet sees how bad the apostasy is. So chapter two underlines how rebellious this people is and how they have transgressed against the Lord. It's a tough mission. The only thing that's underlined here is that Ezekiel does not have to be successful. He has to be faithful to the prophet, to the prophet's mission, which is to preach the word of God. And I think we can learn a lot from that because sometimes we look at the results in our life and we fail to look at, am I being faithful to what God wants me to do? And this will help each one of us to share the faith with others and just talk with others about Jesus, his love, his repentance, his forgiveness, and not get worried if we get rejected, but to do so in a loving, respectful way to others, not worrying about if we're rejected. A lot of times people will reject us and then afterwards they will thank us. So let's go to the responsorial Psalm. Psalm 123 is what you call a Psalm of Ascent. Now, where do you find the Psalms of Ascent? The Psalms of Ascent are Psalms 120, to 134. Now, these are beautiful psalms because they could be prayed by those who are going up to Jerusalem, especially pilgrims. All males over 20 were required to go to Jerusalem. They were required to go on the Passover, 50 days later on Pentecost, and then also on the Feast of Tabernacles. And there were other feast days and celebrations throughout the year. So you can just imagine people coming up to Jerusalem, even for the Sabbath, coming up and singing to the Lord the Psalms of Ascent, especially as they enter the courts of the temple. So Psalm 123, just hold that image of pilgrims coming into the city, praising the Lord. To you I lift up my eyes, the one who is seated in heaven. This is a beautiful image because Jerusalem was the Lord's throne on earth, the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim bending down, forming a throne for the Lord, but it represented that the true God of Israel is enthroned in heaven upon the wings of, of cherubim. The, the tabernacle and then the temple and then even the Ark itself, which was in the Holy of Holies, it all pointed to the fact that this little model of God's throne in Jerusalem was a a earthly representation of the heavenly tabernacle. And all this is important because when you read the letter to the Hebrews, it talks about how Jesus entered not an earthly tabernacle, but the heavenly tabernacle, not with the blood of bulls or goats, but with his own blood, okay? So this image is so beautiful to understand how God dwelt in the midst of his people in Jerusalem, but all of this pointed towards the heavenly Jerusalem. So it says, Behold, the eyes of servants are toward the hand of their master, as the eyes of a handmaid are toward 
towards the hand of her madam or lady or mistress, even so our eyes are towards our God and until he be gracious towards us. Now, this is really beautiful because the concept here is that, you know, just like a servant is focused on his master or a handmaid is focused on, you know, the madam or lady that she's helping out, we are focusing on the Lord and seeking every way to serve the Lord and petitioning the Lord to be gracious, merciful towards us. So the Hebrew verb that's used is chanan, okay? It has the sense of being gracious, favorable, or merciful. Some translate it as pity, but pity is probably not the best translation um, because the word pity in uh, more recent parlance has actually kind of changed meaning. It has more of a pejorative meaning. I pity you, you know, and so it's better to, that it be translated that he be grac gracious, favorable, or merciful, okay? Um, and so going on a little bit, it says, here's the petition, be gracious or merciful to us, Lord. Be gracious slash merciful to us, for we are filled with contempt. So the concept is that, you know, we're we're being, you know, maybe persecuted by our enemies or enemies look upon us with contempt. You can especially um, consider this when Jerusalem was destroyed or maybe after the exiles returned, they lived under four different empires. They lived under the Babylonian empire during the exile, after they returned under the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. So you can see how Psalm 123 would be so profound even after the exile. The psalmist goes on and he says, our soul is filled with scorn of the complacent, the contempt of the prideful. Now, the concept of the complacent is very profound. If you go to the book of Amos, especially Amos chapter 6, verse 1, Amos speaks strongly against the complacent in Zion. Those who see all these injustices and problems and don't do anything okay we might describe that as those who are lukewarm they're basically just happy with their life and they don't want to go out into the world and to bring god's light to this world especially to places where there's darkness so the book of revelation revelation chapter 316 it also speaks against those who are lukewarm because you are lukewarm i will spit you out of my mouth and so it's a very powerful metaphorical image. But you can see the concept here. You know, the concept is that, you know, we don't want to be just complacent, lukewarm, but we want to live the faith in the fullest way. And if we do, we're going to go into the world and bring the light of God into this world of darkness. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He talks about not hiding the light under a bushel basket. So our faith, as we live it, it's going to transform the world around us. So going on a little bit, we go now to 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, this is our second reading. It says, this is what Paul says. Now, Paul, in 2 Corinthians, towards the end of the letter, he's talking about these super apostles, these people who are extremely gifted rhetorical speakers, and they have all kinds of gifts, and they're drawing people to, the, to themselves but they're also misleading people in the, in the Corinthian community. And so Paul is going to talk about how he's not going to boast about his accomplishments, but he's going to boast about his weakness. And this is really amazing if, if you really consider what Paul's getting into here, because I think every single person who has any type of ministry in the church, even if you're just greeting people on Sunday, you can learn a lot about what Paul is getting at when he talks about boasting about his weaknesses. So this is a, you really want to read chapter 11, 12, and 13 to get the context, but we're going to look at just chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And here's what he says, and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, 
a thorn was given to me in the flesh. Now, this concept of Paul received a lot of revelations, even private revelations that never were put in Scripture. This is really important right here. I, it makes me think of John of the Cross, St. John of the Cross, and St. Teresa of Avila. St. Teresa of Avila, she received a lot of private revelations, and she was actually told by her spiritual director, keep it to yourself. Don't go out there and you know, start sharing all this stuff with everybody and calling all this attention to yourself, because that will become a form of pride and possibly, you know, even lead to some downfall. Of course, you know, this private revelation that you're receiving, it's its to help build up your own personal life. And so this is very important right here, because sometimes in the church, we have people who think they're receiving private revelation, and they're running around to sharing this with everybody, and I and I will often say, well, why don't you go look at what St. Paul said about that in chapter 12, verse 7. Okay, and so it says, and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, this is really important right here. Many people throughout the ages have questioned, what was the thorn in the flesh? And there's been um, wild speculation over this. But I think that Paul does not tell us what it is for a reason. He doesn't even want us to know what his greatest suffering was, a messenger of Satan to harass me, a thorn in the flesh given to me. In other words, he talks about his greatest struggle, but he uses a little bit of veiled language. And this is very important because every one of us is going to have incredibly difficult struggles. We're going to have struggles that challenge our faith in the most profound way. And we can look at what Paul went through and he doesn't even get into the fine details. And when we go through our struggle, we have to be able to say the same thing. Your grace is sufficient, Lord. For, look what he says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In weakness, God shows us the, the, the power of faith. The, 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 and so we have to be, we have to have what's called perseverance when there's trials. The book of Proverbs provides a beautiful image a couple times. It talks about how just as gold and silver are purified when they go through fire, so our faith is purified as we go through trials. It's a biblical image that's used again and again and again. And so what's important about this is that we must be able to recognize when we're going through a difficult trial. A lot of people, what they do is they fail to recognize when they're in the midst of a trial and they fall big time into whatever that temptation or difficulty is. They lose their cool. They do something that they shouldn't have done. They say something they shouldn't have said. And sometimes they even fall into despair where they lose all hope. So it's so important to recognize that we're in a trial. And then even in that moment of weakness to look to the cross of Christ and to ask our Lord for his grace in the midst of that trial. Then look, so look at what Paul says about this. I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness. In contrast to the super apostles who are out there showing off and calling everybody to themselves, like the prosperity gospel preachers that we have today, look at what Paul's saying. I will all the more gladly boast of my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul's not going to go out and boast about anything, and he could he could easily outdo all of them with all that he has done. No. Instead, he's going to talk about how he's been crucified and rejected and suffered. And, and to you know, for Paul, that's proof of somebody who's really preaching the gospel. And there's something beautiful here, because sometimes we look at our you know, priest and our ministers of the gospel with superficial standards. 
And, and we, we, we don't really look at how is this person suffering and giving themselves completely and even being rejected. I often like to tell people in uh, my own work that I do, forming seminarians, forming candidates for the diaconate, I often like to tell them that on the day that you are rejected and nobody appreciates you at all, realize that you are doing the work of Christ on that day. And, and that's something really to consider. When no one recognizes you for anything and you're persecuted, and as long as you're being faithful, realize you are doing the work of Christ on that day. That's what we want to look at. So he goes on, he says in verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So this is something that we can really take to heart as we live the faith. You know, on, on the day that we are completely rejected, then we can say, Lord, now I feel like I'm walking with Christ. Now I'm really serving you and, and continue to be faithful and recognize at that moment, Christ is our strength. Okay, so let's go on a little bit here. I want to go on to the gospel reading. So the gospel is from Mark chapter 6. The gospel acclamation is the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. You find that in Luke 418, but it's actually a reference back to Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. And so we go to the gospel. It's from Mark chapter 6. Here's what it says to Jesus, very similar to the first reading. It says, he went away from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom given him? Now look at, they're, they're impressed in one sense, they're impressed. But watch how this is going to change. Where did this man get all this? What is the wisdom given to him? What mighty works are wrought by his hands? So they seem to be impressed with all that Jesus is doing. But watch how this gets turned upside down. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters with us. And so I think we know this guy. Why do we need to listen to him? And they took offense at him. Look at this. They took offense at him because they knew him. Now, this goes back to the first reading, obviously. Ezekiel's going to be rejected by his own people. He's going to a rebellious people. He's preaching to those who are in exile who are rebellious, and he's going to be transported to Jerusalem where he's going to see a rebellious people. And here's Jesus going to his own town, Nazareth, and they are rejecting him. Now, what's really interesting is the word for carpenter, a lot of scholars have noted that it's more than just like somebody who works with wood, but it has kind of a more general sense of one who works with their hands. Okay. That's kind of interesting. So it's more than just a woodworker. It's one, one who works with their hands. It could be a very broad sense of labor. Um, and then at the same time, he's called the son of Mary. He's often called, uh, she's often called the mother of the Lord. Okay. And in the Eastern Church and in the Western Church, if you look at the ancient church, East and West, they always believed that Mary was a virgin. That's very important. The Gospels never say that these were children of Mary, okay? They're called brother, brothers, but it, it's a much more general sense, especially if you look at how the word brother is used in Hebrew. It's a very general word. So the brothers of Jesus, the Eastern Church considered these to be that Joseph was a widower and that these were um, children through a prior marriage. In the West, they considered them to be cousins. But the unanimous understanding always was that Mary was a virgin. And that's very important. OK, and if anybody questions you on that, you can just say, like, why doesn't it tell about her giving birth to any children? Why doesn't it say that their children are married? It never says their children are married, never says she gave birth to other children. So let's be very clear about that. Verse four, it's, Jesus said to them, look at what he says. 
A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own kin and in all his house. And so essentially he's referring to the fact that prophets were rejected by their own people and he's being rejected by his own people. And it goes on and says he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So the work that he wanted to do among them, it was limited because there's a lack of faith. And it says in verse six that he marveled at their lack because of their unbelief. And this is very important because Mark's gospel has a very strong focus on 